As you can tell from my picture, I'm Barry Pallotta. I'm a program manager in the DARPA Biological Technologies Office. And I'm going to tell you about a couple of my programs that are designed to improve the productivity of the drug and vaccine development pipelines. But before I get to that, I'm going to tell you something about myself, because it will give you insight into DARPA's processes and culture. So way back in 1987, I joined the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, as an assistant professor of pharmacology. And for the next 15 years, I studied ion channels. And I did all the things that professors typically do, like go to committee meetings, uh, wrote grant applications. I got married. <laughs> and my entire life revolved around my laboratory. Even now, as I tell you about it, I remember the excitement I felt when Eppendorf tubes became available in different colors. <laughs> but believe it or not, after about 15 years, I started getting bored. And I started losing my interest in science, which was really sad, because I'd been interested in science since the sixth grade. And I found myself thinking about life on the outside. And I realized that I, what I wanted to do was I wanted to go to interesting places and see really cool things. And I don't mean on the internet or on TV, but in real life, in person. And even more than that, I wanted a motorcycle. <laughs> so in 2001, I turned to the internet to try and figure out what to do with the rest of my life. And there I discovered the Institute for Defense Analyses, which is a think tank in Alexandria, Virginia. And when they after they interviewed me, they offered me a position. I accepted it after having been in academia in Chapel Hill, as a matter of fact, for 18 years. So I get to Ida. I'm sorry. So after 18 years in academia, I'm now taking on a new job. I resign my tenure. I'm going to take on this new position. And believe it or not, I had no idea what the job was. I knew that Ida performed scientific and technical analyses for the Department of Defense. But the details of what I was actually going to do when I got there were really kind of fuzzy. Matter of fact, some of the details were secret, so they couldn't even tell me till I got there. No matter, sold my house, packed up wife and cat, moved to the DC suburbs. So I get to Ida, and I find myself now a science advisor to several DARPA program managers. And my first task was to, to, to help with the evaluation of some research proposals that had been submitted to DARPA for potential funding. And I thought, great, this is something I know how to do. Right? I got this. Wrong. Completely wrong. See, throughout my scientific career, I'd been taught to look for all the flaws in any journal article or research proposal or even idea. And of course, the more flaws you found in something, the greater the admiration from your colleagues and the higher your status. <laughs> but DARPA did things differently. Instead of focusing on the flaws, they focused on the parts of a proposal that were original or innovative, even if they didn't know where it might lead. At other times, they seemed to be looking at different parts of proposals because they fit together into some sort of long-term plan or something they called a vision. I had no idea what the heck they were talking about. And all told, I would say it took me at least two years to shift my perspective from one that focused on the things that were wrong to one that emphasizes what's good and what's worth pursuing. And I also had to shift my perspective from the laboratory scale types of problems that I used to work on to the very, very big and important problems that DARPA is able to address. Now, while I was undergoing this attitude readjustment, DARPA was starting to take an interest in drug and vaccine development. And in 2006, I was asked to identify nascent technologies that might be applied to improve the productivity of the drug and vaccine development pipelines. So when I came to DARPA in 2011, I knew that the pipeline was failing us, and I wanted to do something about it. One of the big bottlenecks is that animal testing only predicts human safety and efficacy about 10% of the time. 
But now that I was a DARPA PM, I knew what a vision was. And I had one. And the vision was for a platform, or a box, or a gizmo, whatever you want to call it, that contained human cells that would respond to a vaccine or drug candidate just the way a human would. And this vision was described in a broad agency announcement and this announcement described the problem we wanted to solve, but it doesn't say how we want to solve it. It just says, here's the problem. And, it's, and we asked for proposals from the scientific community describing how this box or platform might be built, what would be inside, what would be the data that comes from it. And as a result of a competitive process, uh, two large contracts were, were let out, one to the Harvard Wies Institute and the other to MIT. And I'm just going to tell you for a moment something about the MIT platform. The MIT platform consists of several interconnected chambers that you can see up there, or up there. And these are connected together by an artificial circulatory system that mimics our own circula circulation. Within each compartment are human cells that mimic the responses or mimic the functionality of the major human physiological systems. And as of today, MIT has demonstrated four microphysiological uh, systems on the platform, but they're on the micro scale. And those four are the liver, gut, lung, and endometrium. And these are interacting together on the platform and viable for two weeks. In about a year, I'm expecting MIT and Harvard to demonstrate seven microphysiological systems on their platforms. And at the end of the program in two and a half years, I'm expecting to see 10 interacting systems on these platforms viable for a whole month. Now, since we're in New York, I should mention that the, um, the Harvard microorgan chip, uh, several of those were purchased by the Museum of Modern Art and are on exhibit right now, and they will be for the next year. So that's a new category of, of, uh, of assessment that I'd not thought of before, artistic merit. But, you know, live and learn. So let me bring you up to date now on, on a brand new program that I just started. And this new program came about due to the convergence, or some would say collision, of, of one of my long-term interests with a brand new one. And the brand new interest was stimulated by this publication from the CDC that came out in late 2013 describing the antibiotic resistance threat. And as you know, and as you've heard before, the news on this front is not good. We're seeing more and more infections in the United States and abroad that cannot be treated by any antibiotics. And part of the reason we're in this fix is that resistance to brand new antibiotics emerges in only about a year, which is faster than our pipeline can produce and market new ones. Now, while my team and I were, were reading this and um, looking at the really nice pictures and thinking about it, we had been revisiting one of my long-term interests, which was in bacterial social systems. And in particular, I was very interested in how bacteria wage war against their competitors. As you know, bacteria fight over food, over territory, over sex, so they're just like us. And in reviewing the literature, the literature on bacterial social systems, by the way, we discovered something that we had never heard of. It turns out, there's something called predatory bacteria. So just as cats prey on mice, wolves prey on sheep, there are bacteria that prey on other bacteria. Who knew, right? It was certainly new to us. So here's a picture of, a, uh, of one of the predators. This is in, shown in yellow is Delavibrio bacteriovorus. This is a gram-negative bacterium that is propelled by a flagellum, and it swims around until it finds another gram-negative bacterium, in this case shown in purple, at which point it attaches, it bores a hole in the outer membrane, it squirms inside, starts to feed, reproduces, and in doing so kills the, um, the prey. You can see the entire life cycle in this movie from Liz Socket's lab at uh, Nottingham University in the UK. And what you're going to see are these bacteria, these oblong ones, are the prey, these are E. coli. And you'll see smaller objects swimming around, these are the predators. And when the movie starts, you're going to see a predator come in from this lower left corner and immediately enter into this bacterium here where it will start to incubate. And then over what's really a three or four hour period, 
the, the daughter cells will burst out. So if you can start the movie now, there he goes. Now he's inside. Now, if you look at this one here, he's already got one in there. You'll see that it elongates, it septates. And out they come. And now they are going around and they are hunting for additional prey. Now, right now you're thinking, where can I get one of these? <laughs> and the answer is, they're all around us. They're in soil, they're in water, they're in sewage, they're in your intestinal microbiome right now. Now, why is this interesting? This is, was interesting to us because Daniel Kadori at Rutgers had published a paper, also in 2013, showing that these predators will readily prey on antibiotic-resistant pathogens that had been isolated from human patients, but in test tubes. So about two weeks ago, we kicked off a brand new program called Pathogen Predators. And this program is going to look at the feasibility of using predatory bacteria as a therapeutic to treat antibiotic-resistant infections. So let me finish up by telling you about the future I'm hoping to build and trying to build with DARPA, of course. I've told you about the Microphysiological Systems Platform I expect this platform is going to have a huge impact on all aspects of the drug development and vaccine development pipelines. But think about this. Think about the impact that this platform is going to have on the entire biomedical research enterprise if what is essentially a surrogate human is now readily available that anyone wants to purchase it. We just talked about predatory bacteria. If we can show the feasibility of using these as a treatment for antibiotic-resistant infections, we will have opened up an entirely new line of uh, treatment for antibiotic-resistant infections, not to mention other types of infections. We're also going to hopefully open up an entirely new line of uh, research into the molecular mechanisms that allow these bacteria to do this sort of thing. We basically have no idea how the predatory bacteria find their prey and the sequence of molecular steps that are initiated after that leading to the life cycle I showed you. I don't know where that's gonna lead. But it sounds really interesting, and I bet it's something that we'll be able to exploit for our mutual benefit. Finally, the last thing I want to say is that, as you've heard many times today, DARPA is very open to new ideas. If you have interesting research that you're doing, and that might lead to a new capability, or it might even cr uh, create turmoil in biology, we'd like to hear about it. It's easy to contact us, start the dialogue with DARPA, because we can't do this job by ourselves. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff Ling, who is gonna take us out. <laughs>